I'm going to share with you this morning something which can set you free. Because God intended that the good news set you free. But you have to understand what the good news is, all that it means. And sometimes in our grasp of the gospel, we've missed what the good news is. And we've missed what God has now made possible for us through the gift of his son. The witnesses and the promise. Simeon was a man with an expectant heart. God had promised him that he would not die until he had seen God's Messiah. Now, just think of his faith and trust. Israel had been looking for the Messiah for hundreds of years, and he hadn't come. In spite of what seemed impossible, Simeon believed God and waited expectantly. When Mary and Joseph presented Jesus in the temple, Simeon was there with an expectant heart. And so it was that God spoke to him and said, This is my son. And Simeon praised God and said that this child would cause many to fall and many to rise. In the temple there was also an elderly woman named Anna. Anna had had every reason to turn bitter, lose hope, and turn her back on God. Anna had known sorrow, but did not become bitter. She had grown old, but never ceased to hope, never ceased to worship, never ceased to pray. And thus she was open to hear God speak to her about his son. These were the two people who greeted Mary and Joseph and the baby in the temple. What did their words mean? Have we fully understood what they were talking about? We will not fully understand them unless we go back to the beginning. The beginning is at creation itself. Let's look again at what happened as recorded in the Bible. When God finished preparing the heavens and the earth, he created man in God's own image. That means that he made man to be just like himself, a marvelous being with God's intelligence, God's creative ability, God's authority to rule, and God's immortality. That is what the Hebrew words mean. And God set this marvelous being, our ancient ancestor in Eden, and turned the earth over to him. God gave man the earth. And man was to subdue the earth with all its vast resources. In other words, man was to develop this earth to its fullest scientific and material potential. The Hebrew words say that, that God then looked upon all that he had created, and behold, it was very good. It was suitable, pleasant, pure, happy, beautiful, prosperous, excelling, and he approved it completely. That is the meaning of the Hebrew words. Now just think what it was like when we were first created. There was no imperfection. No evil, no disease, no tragedy, no want, no misery, no starvation, no tears, no death, no anguish, no sorrow, no mourning, no grief, no pain. All was perfect. All was beautiful. All was joy and love and exciting. Man was the ruler, the king, the supreme authority over all the earth. And he could do with it whatever he wanted to do, because it was his. It was all his. Now, we do not know how long man ruled before tragedy came. But during that time before the Hisser came, the earth must have been a most wondrous place. But the Hisser came. The Hisser is the form that Satan took in the Garden of Eden. Now, many people do not believe that there is a devil. Many people think that the whole story of the Garden of Eden is a myth and really doesn't mean anything. The Bible does not allow us to ignore what happened in the Garden of Eden. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus' birth, 
and life and death and resurrection are all part of God's plan to defeat the devil and to undo the evil works of the devil. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's works. If we are to understand what Simeon and Anna were talking about, then we must know what the Bible says about Satan and what Jesus has done about it. In places like Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 17, Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45, Ephesians 6, 10 to 14, Mark 5, 1 to 19, and Ezekiel 28, 13 to 19, God tells us about an angel. An angel named Lucifer, who was perfect in every way from the day that he was created. He was created by the Lord Jesus. Heaven's skill and love went into making him after the divine image. He was vested with every grace and anointed as the guardian of God's glory. None was wiser, none more beautiful, none more important than Lucifer. But a day came when sin was found in Lucifer. Sin is rebellion against God, and Lucifer rebelled. It seems that he fell in love with himself. He became impressed with his wisdom and exalted by the importance of his job and his beauty. And he deluded himself into thinking that he could be like the Most High. He was blinded by self-love. Lucifer, of his own free will, began to seduce the angels under his charge. And then when he thought he had enough power, he led an assault on the throne of God. Lucifer's rebellion cost him his name, his job, and brought eternal banishment from the kingdom of God. His name was changed from Lucifer, star of the morning, to Satan, the adversary. Once an example of holiness, Satan has become the personification of evil. Now Satan was a king without a country. And he watched God create man and give birth and, to, and give man the earth to rule and subdue. And Satan saw his chance. Satan knew if he could get man to rebel against God, then he, Satan, could take over the earth. He would get it from man. And this was the setting for the drama that unfolded in the Garden of Eden. The hisser came. He very cunningly suggested that since man was created in God's image and had God's intelligence and God's creative ability and God's immortality, then man could be just like God. Man ate the bait. He disobeyed God, thereby joining Satan's rebel gang. And in that act, the control of our lives, our very existence, passed to Satan. And that is how it is that Satan came to be the king, the ruler, the prince of this world, as Jesus called him. And man became the servants of Satan. Well, Satan thought he was pretty smart. But he's nowhere near as smart as he likes to think he is. And he made two blunders that have been very costly to him. The first, he didn't count on the fact that those Old Testament people could turn to God of their own free wills and that that would give God the right to step in and to help those men. Satan never dreamed that there'd be an Enoch who would walk with God and God would take him to be with him forever. Satan never dreamed that there'd be a man like Abraham who would listen to God and respond to God in faith and claim God's promise that his descendants would be like the grains of the sand and the stars in the sky. The second blunder that Satan made was that he never dreamed that there would be a girl, a girl who would agree to, be, to bear God's son. Now, through his craftiness and treachery, he'd managed to overthrow King Saul, and he got King David's grandchildren to sinning, and so had the nation of Israel 
all but wiped off the face of the map. And right when Satan thought he had things pretty well wrapped up, a young girl said that she was willing to be the mother of God's son. She was willing to undergo all of the ridicule of having an illegitimate child with a preposterous claim that God was the father. Satan from the beginning has worked very hard to destroy every last trace of God's image in man. He hates God, and that's why he hates man. Because when he sees man, he sees that image of God that's still there. He brought sickness and suffering into the world. God didn't bring it. God created the world perfect, but Satan brought sickness, and Satan brought suffering. And make no mistake about that. Satan is the father of all disease, of all evil, of all poverty, of all suffering, of all frustration and failure. There wasn't any of these things until Satan came. And he has used these weapons relentlessly. He tried to get Job to curse God and die, but Job wouldn't budge. He used all of his powers of lying and deceit and temptation and hindering. Now, while Satan cannot make direct attacks upon human bodies, he can engineer circumstances so as to bring sickness upon us and to keep us sick and to imprison us in our own lusts and weaknesses. He can't take lives at will, but he can cause people to be his instruments for taking other people's lives to cause accidents, to arouse nations to fight each other. He seems to have power over all of the elements. Inasmuch as he is called the prince of the air by Jesus, and it is believed that when the storm came at sea that time when Jesus was asleep in the boat and the disciples were afraid that the water would swamp them and they would drown, it is believed that this was an attempt by Satan to drown Jesus and in that threat. The true mark of Satan's presence is destruction. Our enemy is not God. Our enemy is not other people. It is Satan. And when we understand this, and then we understand what God has done about it, it opens the doors to freedom and life and possibility that we've hardly dared to dream of. The reason for Satan's relentless attack upon us and upon our loved ones is that we still are the image of God, tarnished and damaged as we may be, and he hates us with all of the fury and hatred he can muster. Now, in spite of all of his efforts, Satan could not stop a young girl from saying, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to what you have said. And with those words, a great blow knocked Satan down. And with those words, a great release and a great freedom began for us. In his great children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, <coughs> C.S. Lewis tells us the meaning of Jesus' death in this way. In the story, Jesus is in the form of a lion whose name is Aslan. And Susan asks what it means that Aslan has risen from the dead. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there was a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little farther back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. And that is just what has happened at the coming of Jesus. Death itself has started working backwards. All of the devices by which 
of Satan by which he has tried to destroy us are working backwards. We are becoming free. We are being restored to the position of honor and power and victory and reigning as kings and queens that was ours before Satan spoiled it all. And the glory of it all is that we can actually start living that life of power and kingship right now. When the evil effects of Satan's influence are so obvious, how can it be that we can start reigning as kings in life now? Well, the answer to that question is in the words that Jesus spoke. I assure you, Jesus said, the person whose ears are open to my words and believes and trusts in and clings to and relies on him who sent me possesses now eternal life. Possesses it now. And he does not come under condemnation, but he has already passed over out of death into life. John chapter 5, verse 24. If a person loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know what Jesus is saying? He is saying that when you receive Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, you are wall-to-wall -wall God inside. Think about that. When you invite Jesus into your heart, you're wall-to-wall -wall God inside. And if God is for you, who can be against you? If you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. No qualifications. John 15, 7. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have appointed you, I have planted you, that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing, that your fruit may be lasting, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. John 15, 16. And then that night, just before he died, when Jesus prayed the prayer, he asked the Father something special, that the world might know something about you and me. Because this is the point in the prayer where he stopped praying for his disciples, and he is now praying for the world and for all of those who will come to believe in him because of the message of the disciples. So that's you and me. We're part of all those who come to believe in Jesus because of the witness of the disciples. And God, Jesus wants us to know, the world to know, that God has loved us just as much as he loved Jesus. John chapter 17, verse 23. Jesus telling us that God loves you and me just as much as he loves Jesus. Paul describes what God has done for us in the gift of Jesus. He justifies and accepts as righteous him who has faith in Jesus. God shows and clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. For if, because of one man's trespass, sin reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and unmerited favor and free gift of righteousness reign as kings in life through the one Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. These words of Paul describe what happens when death starts working backwards and all of the treachery and evil schemes of Satan begin to unravel. Our power and authority as the rightful rulers of this world are being returned to us. And we are beginning to reign as kings in life. Well, if this is true, why are so many people out of work? 
Why does sickness still ravage our families? Why are so many farmers on going under and, and why are so many others with their back up against the wall? Why do the hard, cold facts of life seem to say that we are still the victims of Satan's evil schemes? Well, Paul answers these questions, too, by comparing us to babies. You see, it, all, it doesn't all come full-blown. There's a process of growth and development. We're babes in Christ. We must first learn to crawl and then stand and then walk, and only then do we learn to run. And during this time of learning, we fall down, we get bruised, we stumble and fall. Even experienced runners trip and fall, but they get up and go again. You don't see a little baby stop trying to stand up just because it falls down, but it keeps trying and trying, and it succeeds. We can learn to run because it's our birthright. We were created to run. God is faithful, reliable, trustworthy, and therefore ever true to his promise. And he can be depended on. By him you were called into companionship and participation with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Brethren, I could not talk to you as spiritual men, but as to mere infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not yet strong enough to be ready for it. You see, it's a process of growth. But the thing is, growth is possible now. In the face of difficulties, let us guard against discouragement. Death has started working backwards. We are learning to run, and we shall reign as kings in life. We do have the love of the Father who loves us just as much as he loves Jesus. Satan is defeated. Death is defeated. Sickness and sorrow and pain and tears and anguish are all defeated. We shall learn to run because it is our destiny. Let us rise up and claim our destiny. Let us begin the adventure that God has set before us. Let us learn how to step on Satan's head, to be above and not beneath, to be in front and not behind. Let us begin to learn to crawl, to stand, to walk, and then to run. But we may not get it all done in our lifetimes, but the point is we can do it because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can do it.